supporting the humanitarian sector in the interventions, uh, including affected children by sexual violence. Sexual violence perpetuated against the children in humanitarian contexts are usually not reported or addressed enough. It is still an invisible crisis. Researches and the voices of community professionals highlight the urgent need to reinforce the capabilities of the, the capacities of the services aimed to survivor children. This session organized by the Global Alliance for Protection of Children from Sexual Violence uh, will highlight collaboration opportunities in areas uh, to protect the children while uh, we offer accountability for the children's need. My name is Sarah Habi, and I would like to introduce you to our speakers. First, we have Francesco. He's uh, the Global Voice Initiative uh, NECPAC International Director, leading the design and implementation of uh, programs with members and partners of 2022. He worked many years with Save the Children and has experience um, in different regions uh, focusing on case management services uh, for uh, children, the survivors of sexual violence, exploitation, and human trafficking. Then we have uh, Patricia. She's uh, the a senior advisor on prevention and UN programs, All Survivors Project. She joined the organization in 2016. Apologies for my Spanish. Thank you for your patience. In Colombia, where she works directly with men survivors uh, of sexual violence. She interacts uh, with the survivors, victims, and networks, and has carried out a number of researches about that same topic. So you can get in touch with her if you want to get a little bit more, if you want to know a little bit more. And at the end, or finally, we have Desiret. Uh, she's a psychologist, uh, expert on families and families intervention. She's the regional coordinator in La Guajira from Renacer with five years experience in active search processes of uh, children and adolescents uh, that are victims and at risk of sexual exploitation and uh, human trafficking. She has participated in the development of diagnosis and analysis of violence as sexual violence against the children and adolescents and in the context of uh, the migration crisis uh, of people coming from Venezuela into Colombia. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Francesco and I'll try to be very quick. Before starting the session, I'd like to reiterate three main aspects, just almost like a disclaimer. When we talk about this topic and the work of a Global Alliance for the Protection of Boys from Sexual Violence, it's pretty long, but we call it GAP. You'll be able to see the logo later on. And uh, the three points that I want to mention is that when we talk about boys, uh, male gender, we're talking about boys. We believe that all boys and girls have the rights to be protected against any type of sexual violence. The second disclaimer is that with the work that we do with the Global Alliance, uh, we recognize that girls and women are the main victims of any type of sexual violence and uh, that the gender roles and standards and uh, the patriarchal system affects mainly girls and women. And with the work we do at the Alliance, we do not want to distract from that attention. We want to support greater efforts on eliminating violence against children. We believe that the work can complement the work on gender-based violence. 
This could be a great opportunity to transform gender standards, gender roles, masculinity ideas, and by doing so, reduce uh, gender-based violence against uh, girls and women. And the third point, what you are about to see today is our first presentation as an alliance. And this is a work in progress. Therefore, with today's session, we wanted to share the process that we have uh, followed in order to create it and give you information about the topic. And at the end, we'll open the space to get your recommendations, suggestions, concerns, so we can do it better. Something that I'd like to highlight is that we are doing these uh, in the most careful and uh, participative way because we know that uh, this topic is a very sensitive and we want to support the efforts that are being made already. So if you have any questions, suggestions and comments at the end, it will be greatly appreciated because this is going to influence uh, the process of constructing or building this alliance. Allow me to explain uh, the process to create this alliance. It started in June 2023 in Casablanca, Morocco, uh, where we held the first uh, children or boys uh, summit. It was a workshop. And the first thing is that we had the participation of uh, 65 uh, professionals on child protection of over 60 countries speaking about the different existing practices in order to protect boys against the sexual violence. And what we're missing uh, is the data and practices. And what we need in order to give visibility to this topic is to change the stereotypes and enhance uh, the gender approach on humanitarian interventions and also in other contexts. In this sense, throughout the workshop, something that we heard a lot was the fact that everyone agreed on the fact that there are interventions at the local, international, or regional level, uh, advocacy and practices, but there are things happening and the efforts are very scattered or divided. And what was great about the last year's summit was the fact that people was able to connect and uh, feel less isolated in the work they do. Everyone agreed that it is important to create an alliance that we call GAP. This alliance wants to have members at the local regional and international level and build on the experiences we already have, be able to connect and provide tools and guidance uh, to the protection sector and other sectors connected to child protection in order to understand uh, the complexities that are that affect boys uh, on sexual violence. At the international level, we have a steering committee and uh, we provide a strategic direction. We create an action plan, the advocacy plan, and we are monitoring the type of language and the approach we use. The committee is comprised by the organizations you can see here, All Survivors Project, ECPAT International, Equimundo, Family for Every Child, Physicians for Human Rights, Save the Children, and Women's Refugee Commission. The steering committee, is uh, the organ that decides the direction. Again, this is a work in progress and I cannot stop saying this. If you have any comments, observations, uh, suggestions on how to enhance the work we do so it's relevant and coherent and uh, that actually supports other actors' efforts, it's more than welcome. In terms of, well, the idea is for the members to get access to resources and share their experiences at the local level, experiences that work in their context. But when we talk about masculinity and gender, there are very specific and global aspects. And the main work we're doing this year is that we are developing a global manifesto 
this is a 10 page document more or less and it explains our values and we reiterate our commitment to gender equity and our commitment to child protection and children's right and in the document we also explain the different aspects that affect boys when we talk about sexual violence uh, where uh, sexual violence happens against the boys and what are the main barriers that boys have to face and What are those gaps or the barriers in order so we can work with them? So the manifesto is taking quite a while, uh, but we want it to be adequate and right. It will explain the content, our values, and our call to action. And something that I want to We opened a consultation process with organizations uh, from the gender-based violence sector and uh, uh, the children with a different uh, sexual orientation, uh, disability organizations, uh, survivors-led organizations, and feminist organizations based in uh, the South. And we wanted to tailor these text so it is accepted and useful for everyone. And in this case, the manifesto is going to be launched hopefully this year. We will have an online round table with the uh, gender-based violence sector so they can help us improve even better the manifesto and the action plan. I think that I can give the, the floor to Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Patricia. I work with the Survivors Project ASP and it is a pleasure to be part of this initiative and be here with you so we can get your feedback, comments and observations to do this work the best way possible. I will talk about conflict situations uh, because because of our mandate, we work on the prevention and addressing sexual violence against the boys and men in armed conflict situations worldwide. We recognize that children, well, girls and women are greatly affected by this type of violence and the violation of human rights. But the project was born as, the, as an idea to complement and fill gaps that already exist about, about patterns, impacts, and barriers to access for services for boys and men survivors of sexual violence. Francesco mentioned something positive about this alliance comprised by a steering committee, and we hope that we can grow it, and we hope that we can get more members, and we complement other organizations. We have organizations uh, that bring specific approaches, for example, the humanitarian aspect, the sexual exploitation, masculinities, uh, forensic uh, doctors, and survivor projects. And uh, we work on the angle of uh, sexual violence on armed conflicts against the boys. We know that girls are affected, but sexual violence against the boys in the context of armed conflict is happening. And sometimes it's invisible. We need tools so we can adequately respond and understand the demand. There are many reasons that we know that lead to making this uh, human rights uh, violation invisible. First, we have a gap, gap in information. We do not have data of cases reported, so we can understand the patterns, the impacts, the barriers that inform interventions on prevention and addressing sexual violence against boys. The second, the revelation gap. We know that cases are not being reported uh, and in the work we do in several contexts of armed conflict we work in. Well, especially I work in projects in Colombia and I accompany a group of men victims 
or survivors of sexual violence. And many of them were victims as a children and none of them reported the facts at the moment. And some of them uh, shared that to their mothers or grandmothers and uh, they were treated with uh, home remedies, but they never received the services. Those uh, that had access to services, uh, well, that happened years later, maybe decades later. And this is something that we see often in context of conflict or non-conflict. But in conflict context, uh, there are additional barriers that make these even more difficult. And the third barrier connected to the two prior is the gap of uh, the expertise. Since uh, we don't get to see the cases, they are made invisible. So we do not know exactly how to respond in a, a gender sensitive way an adequate adequate way that works uh, for boys uh, that are survivors of sexual violence uh, we know that there are initiatives and interventions being carried out what we want to do with gap is to join efforts and coordinate because we have learned that this is not something that we can do by ourselves and not with just one initiative from our own perspectives, organizations, and agencies, so we can give our contribution. We want to join efforts in a way that will not take away the attention from the girls as a main uh, survivors of sexual violence, uh, reason why we want to be very careful with what we do. However, even though there are gaps that we know at the global level, evidence shows uh, that boys are also highly vulnerable to sexual violence in armed conflict contexts. In the work of uh, ASP and other organizations, we have documented cases of sexual violence against the boys in conflict situations in more than 30 countries since 1990. And we revised uh, documents uh, from UN sources uh, NGOs, nation, national, international NGOs, and we disaggregated the data so, so we can better understand the impacts and highly vulnerable situations in armed conflict situations. And by doing this analysis of primary and secondary research, we see that there is a number of factors that boys become more vulnerable to sexual violence. We know that children are vulnerable to sexual violence, but they are not equally exposed. The gender expression and diverse gender uh, expressions can increase the vulnerability to sexual violence in armed conflict situations. The socioeconomic reality is also important. A large part, if not all the men that we work with, come from contexts, uh, rural contexts, contexts where they lack access to services and opportunities. And usually the socioeconomic status plays a role in the vulnerability intersecting with other components. Religion, we have seen uh, cases of uh, sexual violence against the boys connected to religion. And the ethnic aspect cannot be ignored either. We have seen documented cases in different contexts, including well, we have identified uh, the detention of privation, deprivation of freedom of children. We know that 95% of children deprived of liberty are children, and usually they face sexual violence in these contexts. Also forced displacement, mobility, the recruitment use, context, so we have done researches and we'll be sharing our findings in Colombia this afternoon. And also the human trafficking is another context. And we see that this is constant in all these contexts throughout the world. Last, we have identified great barriers uh, to access to services for children. We have carried out researches in Afghanistan, Colombia, 
just to understand the main barriers uh, to access uh, to health for children or boys, and we see a number of factors uh, that prevent this. This is connected to gender standards and masculinity ideas and the the idea boys have as being perceived as gays and the relation that exists uh, between homosexuality and sexual violence against uh, boys and uh, men and prejudices exist. Uh, some things that we have identified is uh, gender sensitive documentation. We need to have inclusive legal frameworks as far as gender. Uh, not gender biased and this is important it's not that this is for everyone but we need to consider the unique needs of the boys and the girls we need strong uh, children protection uh, system sometimes uh, it take it takes years uh, to build them but they are needed for protection and capacity building we have seen that joint efforts are crucial this is something that we have seen with the Alliance. We, we want to see it with GAP and we want to explore uh, the way, uh, how do GAP can strengthen the Alliance and the members uh, so we can carry out this joint work the best way. We want to join efforts and we want to shed light uh, into local organizations that are doing this work now and from family, from every child, we want to build a community of practice where we can share challenges and barriers and good practices. Thank you. As Patricia and Francesco has stated, for nobody, it's a secret that women and girls have been the main victims of sexual violence. And uh, we have a lot of data and research that are able to support and bring evidence to all the statistics globally. But today, we would like to ensure that everyone is able to center our attention in the comprehensive way in which we address violence against boys and adolescents. First, I would like to highlight the fact that we should not lose sight that sexual violence can affect equally girls, women, and also boys and men, but also that the emotional impact that they suffer is almost the same. Keeping in mind that boys and men, it's a lot more difficult for them to be able to express and verbalize these facts based on some of the interventions that we've had in the field it's difficult for them because they're very much afraid not only for being stigmatized or being pointed at because when we talk about sexual violence the sexual perpetrator reinforces their malehood and the adolescent or the boy that's a victim is feminized for allowing abuse. So it's almost the entire responsibility upon them, the fact that they were abused and the fact that they were sexually exploited. So boys and adolescents that are victims face challenges very much linked to the construction of their identity. Patricia talked about this specifically when we talk about when they're able to be recognized as victims. They were afraid to be pointed out as homosexuals, meaning that violence is completely invisible, specifically for this group. I would also like to talk about some of the main biases that block reviewing and working on violence in Latin America and Central America. We're working on Central America. Our system is highly patriarchal. At a very early age, adolescents need to start or reaffirm their masculinity many times by going to 
prostitution houses and accessing sexual services. When adolescents move away from this, the entire community starts to point at them and to look at them differently. In the context of sexual violence for girls and women, they're pointed at uh, and many times the word is doubted. When I talk about boys and adolescent males, society, well, we are even more hurtful. We doubt what they're saying. They always have questions like, why did you allow that? Did you like it? Why were you quiet about this for such a long time? Uh, you were able to say something. Why didn't you hit them back? You're a man. Things cannot happen to men like this. You're strong. You had ways to defend yourself. All these phrases, I have taken this directly from an intervention uh, in a boy in a community in Colombia. The boy said that he was sexually abused by his uncle. And in that abuse situation lasted for five years before he decided to talk about all this. All these questions were asked by his, you know, family, his close family. Why did I talk about this? Now it's my fault. It was very difficult to, you know, move him away from that train of thought where he felt guilty about what happened to him. There is something else that happens when we talk about sexual exploitation and it's that society as we've stated previously boys and adolescent males need to reaffirm their role as men so they see that it's not as serious that a sexual ex Ploider is a woman because then he is reaffirmed as a male and as the macho role that they need to fulfill in society. But when it happens from a man and it's a boy, since you are homosexual, you have a diverse gender identity, then prostitution is your only way out. Another example in regards to the first victim, a man that I identified in 2018 in a mix. My question flow from Venezuela to Colombia. In the Colombian Guajira area, is right at the border with Paraguachong. And they went through that area with hundreds of people that were Venezuelan migrants, among them boys and adolescents, which were unaccompanied. Back then, at the border municipality, where we carried the report, to be able to report to the competent authorities a situation of sexual exploitation of a boy, the family ombudsman right at that moment, she was very impacted and she asked me so many times, are you sure what's in this report? Is it true? Is it true that this is happening here? Who is exploiting them? Is it a man? Is it a woman or is it other men? Like validating the fact that, oh, if it's a woman, then maybe it's, you know, not as serious. Right at that moment, she was very afraid and she talked about in a manner where she had no knowledge. So she at that point was requesting that we spoke to that boy and for him to tell us who was the sexual exploiter so that the person could be caught immediately. And she was also speaking from a place of fear because there was very little institutional response for that specific problem. Right now, well, it continues to be the same. Things have not really changed. It's been five years now, and we're still in a regularization and stabilization phase with the migratory flows. But sexual violence, sexual exploitation and abuse, it's a lot more visible right now. Something that's really positive, quote unquote, in regards to migration is that humanitarian assistance has come into the territory and we have been able to bring visibility to all these cases of violence abuse exploitation and human trafficking of boys and adolescents
I would also like to talk about human trafficking of boys and adolescents in Colombia. We talk about uh, people trafficking and we feel like, oh, that's something that happens so far away from us to Colombian people. Sometimes it's difficult to understand that there is human trafficking. In our work, we're always identifying victims. There was a research done quite recently right at the borders, La Guajira and the border with Cucuta and also in Cartagena and the area of Sartamanta, which are cities that have a high flow of tourism. A lot of the boys that we've interviewed, they stated that they were part of, you know, really bad name agencies. That's what they called them. But these were the traffickers. They had girls, but also boys. So when the boys were recruited, one of the main questions was, are you homosexual? Can you have a sexual activity with boys and with men and women and with trans uh, persons? And immediately they agreed upon a price for the exchange of uh, sex. And also the boys stated that they created fake IDs for them, fake passports. And when they were in the city of Cucuta, they were asked to come to a park. When they went to the park, then trucks would come by to pick them up to move them to Santa Marta and to Cartagena, where they were then sexually exploited. There is a story of a boy that stated he was the worst experience in his life. He got the fake ID first. He, he was sexually exploited. And after that, they did not pay for what was agreed. The boy stated that after the sexual exploitation and the activity where the perpetrator he decided to leave and he thought that they were going to pay. But since the initial agreement is that they had to stay for 15 days in that island, they said that since he left, he could not be paid. These are realities that boys that are sexually exploited have to live through. Also in the area of Maikau, quite recently in December 2023, we identified that there are virtual platforms because now you don't see the boys in the context of prostitution, like in the street, but it's done through platforms where people are able to have access through their cell phones. And in that manner, they're able to contact the boys and the adolescents for the sexual exchange. And it's something that decreases the level of visibility and it further exacerbates the sexual exploitation situation because how can we control that? There are other challenges, as it was previously mentioned, access to protection services. We've talked about the need of continuing to train and create awareness and and training to institutions, to the first responders, to victims from the very first moment that a report is made. In these spaces, they re-victimize, ask additional questions or ask questions in an inadequate manner. Or when they typify the crime, it's done wrongly. They don't use sexual exploitation. They don't use human trafficking. It's just sexual abuse or carnal abuse to a person. In Colombia, we have a jurisprudence that is able to sanction sexual uh, violence and exploitations, but this process is very slow. And for victims, it's very difficult. And access to justice is difficult. And when we talk about 
it's just natural. They say, oh, he's homosexual, then he liked it. He decided that uh, he wanted prostitution. We can't do anything about that. It's a case that would further collapse the judicial system. All these phrases have been stated out there in the territory when we bring up cases of boys and adolescents that are victims of sexual exploitation and of human trafficking. So the main challenge is that it's become natural. It's invisible. It's very few organizations that are carrying out in research. It's usually NGOs or civil society. It's not part of the Colombian state. Lack of studies. I take advantage of this space to invite universities. I am inviting academia. Please, let's start from the different university research groups. We should start to study and bring visibility to violence, sexual violence specifically for boys. That would then allow us to obtain real data and about the situations, and we must believe them. I have another message. Sexual exploitation is not part of the life project of any boy or adolescent. Thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this exposition. I am Estela Duque. I am from Colombia. I am part of the Psychosocial Center Taller de Vida. And we are also members of the organization Family for Every Child, which brings together 32 countries and it's 47 organizations. 47 organizations with a proposal of an intervention with families joined together first to guarantee that all boys and girls have the right to a family, but also to ensure that they are protected from different forms of violence. That's the partnership as a partnership family for every child in the year 2019. We had a meeting in Chile five organizations together. It was Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, Chile, the Philippines. And we started to reflect upon the fact of something that we found in the work we did, which was sexual violence against boys. And we realized that it was not being addressed and it was not being recognized. In Colombia, we work with boys and girls that come out of the armed groups. They leave them. And then we realized that we had some reports and we had some cases. But in all the attention protocols or care protocols of all the different institutions in regards to reinstituting their rights, this was not included. And as Decide stated, it was unknown. So in 2019, we talked about this. Philippines, on their part, they work with children from the Catholic Church, which were in boarding houses, and many of them had suffered sexual violence in these boarding houses or boarding schools. And the Philippines organization was intervening at this point. In Chile, it was the same time. Thing. We worked with another organization that was working with boys which had suffered sexual violence in the framework of the Catholic Church and its institution. And in Guatemala, they looked at migration. These boys that had suffered different situations in the migratory process, but they also had sexual violence specifically against boys. This is something that led us to research, study for boys, How, what to do on behalf of family for every child. And we decided that the best way to respond was to develop a global campaign and to raise our voices, join efforts together and to try to bring visibility to the fact that boys are also exploited, used, and are sexually violated. Where we created the campaign of the Blue Umbrella. The Blue Umbrella campaign, it's developed since 2021. 
it's three years now, 26 countries, 26 organizations, I'm sorry, in 22 countries, which are part of family for every child, very much committed. And it's not just family for every child. Now it's 12 networks of organizations to be part of the campaign. What is the Brew Umbrella campaign? It's an awareness mobilization where we open the blue umbrella. It's a shame that I didn't bring it out with me today, but we do open the brew umbrella and we talk about the topic in Colombia. I would like to highlight this where I work and for 30 years we support boys and girls who have suffered in the framework of the armed conflict displacement and other situations, but we support boys and girls and also adolescents and youth in the process of inclusion into the civil society. We have achieved that institutions like the Colombian Family Wellbeing Institute can be present in the different actions of this campaign, very present, so that they can start uh, to talk about the protocols, how they are able to intervene, and how we can show and recognize the impact of sexual violence against girls. Yes, but we should also look into protocols when it is boys and adolescents. Very, very much related to the cultures of origin. We are a country that is multicultural, diverse, indigenous, and Afro population, which is not just Colombia, but many other countries in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and many places in the world. And how can the protocols be further expanded? Right now, we work from the campaign, which starts every April 16. We open up the blue umbrella, and it's kept open throughout the year, supporting actions in the world including voices and raising awareness. In Colombia, we have allowed organizations like the National Institute for Wellbeing to be part of that campaign. Something else that we were able to achieve is that the governments in the regions like uh, uh, Maikao and also uh, and the mayor and Risarada, which is a different department in Colombia, we have all the participation of the mayors, uh, social actors, and responsible of uh, public policies to work on this. And we have also worked with the support of the media. This year, three g regional TV channels allowed us on April 16 to talk about this and to invite youth. And another step with this campaign of the Blue Umbrella, it's a awareness campaign. Moving from being a campaign to a movement. This day, a lot of boys and youth talked in the media and they would dare to speak to their communities, indigenous communities. I don't know but if you know this, but in Colombia, indigenous communities work with different organizations and they have their own councils, their own laws, and their own ways of managing politically. So how they manage their lives and all these aspects. But we also have things related to providing services to those that are part of the leave the armed conflict. So we are partnership to bring visibility to this, ensuring that it happens and to be able to find different ways of intervention. The blue umbrella campaign continues to have the umbrella open. I invite you hopefully to be part of this. We need to mobilize policies. We are seeking something to ensure that gender violence recognizes the violence against boys from the gender identity that we can recognize. And as it's been stated here, if there is a diverse identity, it's hidden and used as a manner of justifying violence. So we need to continue to advance. We need to continue to transform ourselves. And our invitation is to ensure that you're part of this. Join us. We feel that there are a lot of processes that are missing. 
but also we need a lot more research in regards to the impact, how to transform this, how to accompany them. Also, I would like to bring up a framework here, which I felt that is missing family in many of the different processes that we have been able to address here, working with boys and girls, adolescents and youth means working with families, supporting those families that also suffers and is transformed or is unable to accompany them and generates different types of processes. Also working with the community and ensuring that we're able to achieve processes that lead to an impact. I'm also concerned about uh, something. I don't know if it happens in other countries. It happens in my country. They talk about routes. Oh, they have that route and this route, but routes sometimes are not operative like the roadmaps, they're just documents. So this is why we need actions that create some sort of incidents, impact joining together, like what we do with the Blue Umbrella campaign. Childhood is the house that you would inhabit your whole life. How can we not protect childhood? How can we not raise our voices strong enough to ensure that we bring visibility to bring about changes in with different situations to join us. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor to Miguel. He would like to, you know, add to this. Good morning, everyone. We are also part of the Family for Every Child Alliance, and we've been working in the campaign for three years. The first year allowed us to create reflection, awareness raising processes, and we have worked in the processes of new masculinities. During the second year, we worked directly with the health sector in order to establish specialized care and differentiated care processes for boys and adolescents. Now we are working with the educational sector to strengthen actions on comprehensive education on sexuality to enhance uh, understanding, prevention, and restitution. In Guatemala, we want to document, and this is something that the three of you agreed, there's no registry, and we noted that for boys in Guatemala, unfortunately, 8% of the total cases reported every year come from uh, boys and girls under five years of age. But when, when we look into the data of uh, children under five years of age, we see that the incidence is the same. There's no significant difference uh, between boys and girls. After five years of age, we do see an important difference against uh, teenagers, girl teenagers and women. Therefore, it is important to work on prevention, but it is also important to reinforce and strengthen the efforts uh, so we can ensure protection efforts and restitution efforts. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say that I forgot to mention the QR code. Through the QR code, you'll gain access uh, to the Blue Umbrella campaign. And if you want to delve into it and get to know a little bit more, you can do so. When we started the campaign, this included an investigation with uh, children connected to soccer and a lot of situations that happen around soccer that we do not work on, but we do recognize. Thank you. I'd like to thank our colleagues that have shared everything uh, they noticed. It is important to mention that GAP was born at the local level from professionals that are identifying even more cases and need the necessary tools in order to address and prevent human rights violations the best way possible. So we want to invest on localization within the Alliance. As far as the next steps, just like Francisco mentioned, we are creating a global manifesto about GAP, given details on the principles and the values, our goals, and how we position ourselves. We are doing so hand in hand with youth organizations, LGBTQI+, women and survivors, so we can do it 
an adequate way, a sensitive way, considering the input and the expertise from different sectors. We are in the revision process now, and we should be able to uh, finish everything at the end of the year so we can start launching pilot messages in social media and see how everything is perceived. And uh, this is a complementary work to uh, the sexual violence against the women. The second step is the creation of a platform, online resources platform. We want to join efforts and yes, uh, there is very little research, but it exists. And what we want to do is to find the resources in just one place so professionals can have researches, they can find the different recommendations. And this is something we're doing. We want to do it with Together for Girls and uh, Safe Future Hubs. So it can be presented in the same space and it could become part of the sexual violence against boys and girls approach. So this could be a way to centralize and disseminate existing resources. We also plan to create a website and a newsletter and Francesco will be talking a little bit more about that later. And we also hope to have webinars where professionals can share best practices and through different contexts we can share what we see what's working what's not and we can have a knowledge exchange and a community of practice i believe the most important step now is to open the space for your comments observations questions inputs so together we can build this space and strengthen prevention and address sexual violence against children. Thank you. Here we have a number of existing resources, a survivors project. Well, you can see everything here and we'll be able to share more. If we can move to the next one, please. Thank you. We created a form with a QR code. The idea is to get your contact information if you want us to do so, of course, just to get information on your interest on this topic and maybe key resources you might have. The idea of this alliance is not remove initiatives or the individuality that you carry out with your members. We just want to support and expand. We heard from our colleagues from Family for, us, for Every Child, how can we strengthen uh, the Blue Umbrella campaign. So we would like to hear from you about your resources, initiatives you already have, and maybe you can share the links. And with that, we can create a newsletter through which we'll be able to share the resources or you can contact us. Uh, we can organize a webinar. Uh, you can do researches. We can share tools, trainings, campaigns. This is the idea. We'll display it for a while, for a while. But the main interest today is to uh, get your questions, comments, contributions. So because again, this is a work in progress, and we need your voices. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for sharing. 